hopefully in this talk, I can convince you to go for automation. Uh, tee hee, bad pun, dad joke. Um, yeah, I want to tell you the, some of the lessons I've learned about trying to automate security, make things go faster. So you can look awesome and you don't have to tell your boss, right? This is just like, look awesome and get a raise. I think that's all a good thing. So who am I? I'm a, I like to call myself a reformed programmer. I started out life uh, writing code as a full-time job and then got the security bug and never looked back. Uh, I've had 13 plus years in the OS community. Like Martin was saying, the leader of several projects. I was on the board. I've, I've been on an employee for OWASP. I've done a whole bunch of things. I have 20 plus years of uh, using free Libra and open source software as well as uh, Linux. Uh, as you notice the gopher on the intro slide, I'm a Go fanboy. That's what I like to write my uh, programs in these days. And I do have a, a second degree black belt and Edan in Tongsudo Miguquan, which is a Korean um, a version of karate. So the money shot, right? Everybody loves the money shot. And this was me doing my board break for my second degree black belt. Woo, what was that, two years ago, three years ago, two years ago, I think. I don't know, this whole COVID thing has completely ruined my sense of time. Uh, but everybody loves the money shot, right? No one really talks about the anti-money shot. And, and I'm, I'm going to be real honest with you, there's going to be some work here. Like, it will take some work to do automation. You're not going to push an easy button and just have it. But you do get the money shot if you put in the work. So it is worth the effort, right? So there's going to be... A little bit of, a little bit of uh, effort right to get this done but there will definitely be a payoff as well so let's briefly talk about traditional appsec and I, and I kind of in this deck I, I do devops devsecops appsec security I mix it all up it's all kind of the same to me um, so if you hear if you see the terms shifting around that's really what that is I try to keep it loose because my background is obviously very heavily in appsec but this applies across all the different security disciplines. So there you go. What to me it feels like when I'm running what I would call traditional AppSec tooling, right? It's like jousting with snails. It is painful, it's slow, and it's usually not particularly effective, um, right? Run this thing, it's in a server off by itself. I got to get the results. I got to take it out as a PDF. I got to email that to somebody. It's just awful. Like I, I, I don't like that. Um, and I quite honestly think AppSec, traditional AppSec, uh, was died and buried many years ago. Um, we hardly got to know it, and I'm kind of glad to see it go, because I don't think we were serving our constituency very well. And in fact, to be really honest, I think we weren't doing very well by the developers either, and or any kind of infrastructure team, right, where you run a security tool, you generate a PDF, and you throw it over the wall, right? This is the same problem that DevOps was saying they wanted to fix of developers throwing code over the wall. Well, we threw PDFs over the wall at the developers and it didn't make things better, right? So yes, like management still likes to have PDF reports, but that's not really the way to care and feed your developers. The other thing is, what do people think when they talk to security? They think no, right? I'm gonna to talk to security, the answer is gonna be no. And it really can't be no, that is, that is <laughs> no way to make things right, right? It's not a good idea. Instead, think about it. The purpose of an AppSec program or any security program is to evaluate the security of whatever that domain is, right? It could be the suite of applications for the business. It might be your cloud infrastructure. Maybe it's a, it's a, 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 a whole bunch of desktop computers, right? It's, the, it's your normal corporate land, so to speak. Whatever it is, that's really the goal of a security program you can give informed information back to the business to guide them in the right direction, right? You shouldn't be just the no person. So what I like to ask, and I'd ask this if we were in a, in a physical environment is like, raise your hands if you have, have fuel, a full view of your application landscape. And I think this would be the traditional security answer of no, most people don't. I've actually worked, in, worked with and at a bunch of different companies. And so far I have found one in 20-ish years of doing this work where they actually had a good solid list of all of their applications. Everyone else, it's like, we have no idea. We have maybe a thousand, we have 2000, we have no idea. So there's one more thing you need to do in security to do right by your constituency. And that is provide a clear and direct path for teams to follow. 
And if you're automating security and making it quick and easy, you can actually provide the right feedback loops to keep the, uh, the whatever area you're, you know, the developers in the case of AppSec, right, on that correct path, right? You can notify them when they deviate quickly so they don't get way off the path before they have to do a course correction. So let's talk about security automation. What are the key things to be aware of? Well, I don't have time to talk about them as much as I'd like to, but Deming is fantastic. Um, and he said, one of my favorite quotes of his is, spending time optimizing anything other than the critical resource is an illusion. The idea being is if you're optimizing something that isn't the bottleneck, you're just making new bottlenecks in new places. You're not actually fixing the problem. And my supposition is that people, particularly in the security field, are your critical resource. I have yet to be on a security team where they had too many people and not enough work, right? You, the ratio of an AppSec person to a dev team is usually one to 100-ish. Um, even traditional security is a terrible uh, ratio of them to the assets they need to protect, right? So people are going to be your critical resource. Um, this is why automating things is vitally important, right? You have only a limited capacity of sort of people brain time to get things done. Um, and if you don't, if you can automate the things that are the brainless parts of their job, you can make sure that at least for most of the time, your employees are doing good human being, human thinking sort of things, right? And uh, just did a talk on this uh, a little bit ago in a different uh, uh, topic or topic whatever it was, session uh, in this 20th anniversary with my one of my co-leaders. Uh, but Defect Dojo is kind of the heart of that automation effort, right? It allows you a single source of truth, right? All of this effort you're doing, you can combine in one simple place, which is also a fundamental uh, thing that needs to happen. So quick aside, what's Defect Dojo? It's an open source security orchestration platform for vulnerability management. It'll take over 100 plus tools, security tools, in just the output of those tools, normalize and dedupe those, consolidating them into one view of all of your security findings. Um, from there, you can push them to JIRA. There's notifications to Slack. It gives you a place to list an inventory of applications and also endpoints in Dojo Speak, which is your uh, computer assets. And then you can maintain those lists you can understand what technology, what regulations are tied to which particular application or infrastructure. So I said, security personnel are your critical resource. This is why you need to optimize their work, right? If you can automate the non-human brain things, because let's be honest, when I'm doing the drudgery stuff, I'm actually thinking about like what I have to do this afternoon or, oh shoot, the tires are really low on my car. I got to stop for air. I'm thinking about something else. Right, so let's automate that drudgery stuff and not have the human brain have to cycle on that, right? This is gonna drive up consistency. A lot, you'll find that a lot of these automation tasks are those drudgery things, that if you automate them, they're done consistently and quickly and they're just off your plate. Um, it will definitely increase the tracking of work status. Uh, this is particularly if you're using something like Defect Dojo to manage how those assessments of security are happening and track them. If you normalize things and sort of make concrete paths for them to flow on, you're also going to greatly increase the flow through the system. Uh, you will increase visibility and metrics because you have one place where all of this security work is happening. So it's very easy to report. We've done so many assessments or we, the last time we assessed this product was on March the 4th, right? You can do all those kind of things in one nice place and reduces friction to the dev teams if you're doing things like speaking their language and pushing results into JIRA, right? Ah, so like I just said, talk to your constituency in the language they speak, right? So if you're talking to developers, put findings in JIRA, right? You need to uh, give results to people in a way that they want to intake them, not in a way that works for you. Um, I wish I had more time. I could do 30 minutes on each one of these books. So instead, I'm going to do the old professor thing. And this is an exercise left for the student, right? But if you haven't read any of these books, just pick one and read it. And I'd honestly say you should read all three. All of these books are fantastic. Uh, the Phoenix Project, it's a fictional account of a company and some of the problems they had and how they solved them using DevOps. The DevOps handbook is uh, much more of an instructional guide to how to do DevOps. And then product to project, project to product 
is a great book on how to take these concepts from DevOps and turn them into real world products. Because at the end of the day, if we're working for a company, a company needs and wants to make money. And so being able to do it in a way that's productive for the overall goal of the company is obviously going to win you some friends and positively influence people. So let's talk about AppSec pipelines. Like, um, because years ago, Aaron Weaver and I came up with this idea of like, hey, CICD is really cool and it's been fantastic for developers. Why can't security do something like that? So I don't want to let devs have all the good ideas. I want to steal the ones that work for me. And CICD and the idea around that of having a pipeline was one that I think is fantastic for application security and security in general. So how do you think make things fast but customized, right? Because the whole reason your company has a dev team is they have something special for them. If they could just go buy it off the shelf as a canned piece of software, they would, but they can't, right? So they need to make it. So how do you make something custom, but also fast? And I think uh, like your, your pick your, your favorite vendor burrito place has solved this problem, right? I can go down there and I want to get a burrito with chicken, but double cheese and no uh, sour cream, whatever, right? I can do that. The next person, they've narrowed down the choices to a handful of well-known choices and a path that all things follow. If I get a second burrito, I start at the front of the line and I walk down. If I get a third burrito, I start at the front of the line and I walk down. It all works the same, right? So if you can make your security operations function with a bunch of well-defined steps and choices, um, you can greatly speed up things and still allowing it to be customized. So what do we get with this uh, AppSec pipeline thing? Like I mentioned earlier, you get much better visibility into work in progress because just like in that burrito line, there are stages, right? There's the pick your meat, pick your beans, pick your sides, wrap up the burrito and hand it and off you go. Right. If you have those same kind of equivalents for your security program and understanding your assessments, you know what the state of all of them is. It isn't like I started testing on Monday in two weeks, I'll be done. You can actually know exactly where you're at. Oh, I've done the two SAS, uh, two, I've run the two SAS tools, but I haven't run the DAST yet. And I still need to do a manual pen test. I know exactly where I am with that. Right. And as you're doing this, and particularly one of the things that Defect Dojo allows you to do is break out individual tools underneath one assessment, is you can understand and track where the time is actually taking, where are those bottlenecks that you need to go optimize, right? As you're understanding that, wow, that's really weird. We can do a SAST assessment in a week, but a DAST assessment takes two. Why is that, right? I wanna look at those DAST ones. They're taking longer. Why are they taking longer? Those kind of questions can be answered. And as you've made your security work, these well-defined stages and steps and choices, right? It's gonna shockingly increase consistency because you're, you're forced to choose. I'm gonna get black beans or I'm gonna get refried beans or I'm gonna get charo beans, right? Those are my three choices. It's gonna be A, B, or C. I don't have a lot of other choices, right? Which is fine. That's all you need to do, right? Oh, you're a middle, middle risk app. You only get DAST, we don't do SAST. Right? Maybe that's your policy. Whatever it is, the, the specifics are much more important for your business than in general, but that's the idea of increasing um, consistency. Another interesting thing that grew out of this when I did my first AppSec pipeline that I, I would have bet against was the fact that we got way better understanding of the cost of switching. Uh, and particularly at, at Rackspace when I worked there, there was a lot of like, OMG, drop all your tools and go solve this problem. Well, if I understand what everyone's doing and in what state that work is in, I can have a very good conversation with management of, okay, that's fine. But if I take Sally off that engagement that yesterday you told me was crucial, that work will stop. And it's like, oh, no, Sally needs to keep working on that engagement, right? You can have those conversations instead of having to remember or like ask the team on Slack what's going on, you can just answer. And uh, the, 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 I found the pipeline to be flexible enough to take everyone from a, a, a fresh green intern down to a seasoned tester and just hand out the, the work a la carte based on what their skill set is. So this is a very flexible sort of way to do things. So let's talk about the first generation of AppSec pipeline. And the real core idea here is to look at your team's purpose and those processes with agent. This is a quote stolen somewhat out of uh, the uh, Phoenix project. Um, but really, you want to look at your 
uh, team and say, hey, there's, there's these fundamental steps that happen when you're doing security work. I have intake, right? Requests are gonna come in for you to assess something, right? You need to triage that work, which is the next step. I need to understand what I'm being asked to do, what's the right level of testing, what tools make sense for this level of testing or the risk inherent in this particular app or infrastructure, right? I'm gonna go run a bunch of tests. That's the next phase, the testing phase. And then I'm gonna shove all those results into a single vulnerability repository, hopefully not Excel, <laughs> hopefully something like Defect Dojo. And then you're gonna deliver, right? We're gonna push those results out to something like a GRC tool. You're gonna to run to a defect, you're gonna push individual findings out to developers via Jira or whatever defect tracker they use. You can use a REST API of something like Defect Dojo to do metrics, right, and do reporting. Here's a real world example of the, the first one I ever really built myself and Aaron did this at a large education company. Uh, the bag of holding was an internally developed application. It was open source, but honestly, we wouldn't do that again. And we didn't do that again when we did newer versions of those. We moved all that functionality into Defect Dojo. So really, Defect Dojo can now handle intake as well as being a vulnerability repository. Um, but the idea is here is you're moving left to right. All the tools go through this. When you're triaging, we're deciding, okay, you're a very important tool. You're going to get Veracode, Burp Suite, Zap, um, White Hat, and Qualys, right? You're a, you're a low risk tool. We're only going to throw maybe check marks and Qualys at you, right? You can make these decisions. You can base the, the amount of testing you do on the risk, flow all that to Defect Dojo. And once you have everything going to Dojo, then you only have to solve that. How do I get it to X constituency party uh, problem once, right? I don't need to worry about how to uh, push out results to Jira to, to the developers for every tool. I only have to do that one time for Dojo, which is a big efficiency boost. The whole point of this Gen 1 pipeline is getting your house in order, right? It's really hard for you to tell other teams how to do stuff better if you can't even do it better yourself is how I like to view things, right? So make sure that your internal systems that you use to get testing done work and are functional before you start reaching out and trying to do things with other teams. But when we get to the Gen 2 pipelines, this is where you look outside your team's purpose, right? And see which there are places you can hook in to now start to have little feelers in different parts of the business that are outside of your sort of normal testing flow. Obviously, great place to do this is if you have some DevOps or pipelines running in the development side of the house, why not stub a little test in there? Doesn't have to be breaking. Maybe it just runs and reports back to Defect Dojo, right? What happened in that last pipeline run? Um, but now you have visibility and what's going on in those pipeline runs, right? Depending on how you do dev work, maybe this is running in a dev branch and you can get early warning of issues that are getting added into dev branches before they get merged to master, right? You have some interesting visibility chances and opportunities with this kind of a pipeline. And then let's talk about the third generation of pipelines. This is where you scale your teams um, and try to dramatically increase speed and visibility because you've got your house in order you're now starting to reach out to other teams and integrate with them. Now you wanna go fast. Um, when what do you get with the third gen pipeline? It's a great way to conduct automated testing. It's run by the AppSec team, kind of for the AppSec team, but honestly, those, those feedback results are gonna happen through the normal path if you're using something like Defect Dojo, right out to Jira or whatever kind of place that uh, uh, developers keep those findings. And it's a great way to scale your coverage, right? And the big difference is a lot of sort of security peers will say, well, you can't do really rigorous testing with full automation. And I would say, absolutely, 100%, totally agree with you, no, no complaint. What you will get is breadth. You will get a baseline across, if you run the same tools across all of your repos that have source code, you will have a baseline and understand which ones are really good and which ones are much more scary. What it won't do, because I also like giving you the other side, the good and the bad, it's not gonna fix all your problems. Automation won't make your code better. It'll just let you know it's not good at a faster speed, right? Um, I would not make these tests blocking and gates uh, that never wins you friends or influences people positively, particularly with dev teams. And I like to think of it as, if you think about pipelines, pipelines create artifacts, right? So CICD, if you're doing it right, is gonna give you a deployed app at the end. 
And apps like Pipeline is going to give you findings. And then you have to do the same kind of work with any other finding of getting it to the team, making sure it's addressed, retesting, et cetera. So first get the cake, then do the icing. And Gen 3 uh, pipelines are really my idea of the icing. You've got to have those other pieces in place before you can really go there, to be quite honest. So here's an example of a Gen 3 pipeline. Um, this is really more event based now, right? So you have an event happen. Now that event could be it's time for the quarterly PCI test, or it could be code just got checked into a repo. Doesn't really matter, but it's an event. So an event happens, an AppSec pipeline reacts to that event to launch a bunch of containerized Dockerified tooling, right? This is one of the places where containers and Docker and Kubernetes for that matter gives you a lot of flexibility, right? So now I can launch on the fly one or more tools pointing at a whole bunch of different targets. That could be source code repos, that could be apps running in pre-prod, could be a bunch of things, right? All those tools are gonna run. It will take those results, push them back to the apps like pipeline, which will then forward them on to Defect Dojo where they get stored and normalized and deduped. Right now, if I want to run three very similar tools against the same target, it kind of doesn't matter. I get better coverage and I'll let Defect Dojo take the heavy lifting of merging and understanding what's really actionable out of those three different tool runs, even though they cover the same kind of space. So why should you build an AppSec pipeline? Well, here's another real world example, just to give you another idea of what you can do with this. Where This is where we have the developer checking in code the into stash, right? That stash is going to send a web, web hook and event, right? To an app like pipeline. Docker is going to launch a bunch of containers. Those uh, results will go into Defect Dojo. We'll give a summary to the Slack channel for that dev team and then push those results out to Jira. Now with this exact layout, um, a friend of mine who was doing this was able to look at 15 repos he, over four months, they had 5,100 runs of that pipeline and 25,000 container executions. And those numbers are awesome and they're very impressive. But what it really tells you is they made testing an easy button, right? It's not this onerous process of days or, or God help you weeks to get things done. It's quite honestly, an event happens. I run a bunch of tests. I now can get some feedback on what happened in that event. And if you remember this guy that we talked about just br uh, briefly a little bit ago, this first sort of AppSec pipeline that we created, what did that buy us? Well, in 2014, uh, the, uh, this was a AppSec team, did 44 assessments. We started building the pipeline in, 20, in, the, in the early parts of 2015. By the end of 2015, for reasons that aren't really important. We lost 3.5 people, reorgs and whatnot, but we bumped up 44 to 224. And then two years later in 2016, we took 44 to 414 and lost two more people, right? So we almost 10 x the number of finding, the number of assessments our team could do while losing people. And most of this was due to automation. So yeah, that's an eight, 840% increase, almost 10X. Oh, and one final little bit, there's this really interesting uh, uh, talk there. Uh, I guess it was a blog post. Maybe it was a YouTube video. I honestly can't remember, but it was called the Iceberg of Ignorance. And it was speaking to how problems get hidden the, the further away from the front lines you get, right? Staff are going to see 100% of the problems. They're in the front lines. They're interacting with the customers or your software or whatever it is. They see all the problems. The team leads are going to catch a good chunk of them, 74-ish percent of the problems. Team managers, maybe 9%. And the executives are going to see about four. So how do you get that bottom two-thirds or more of that iceberg up to the level to where management can see it. Well, you do that with security automation, right? It helps you push that visibility north. And the way you do that is if you have a security baseline, and I can say I'm scanning all of my repos, and of all of the repos, 10 of them are green, and six of them are red. That's that is, <laughs> if there was ever something designed for executives, 
that's the kind of results you can do when you baseline, right? How many meet our baseline? How many don't meet our baseline? Those are very simple, easy to consume metrics that make sense to the executives who quite honestly have bigger problems to, to fill than knowing that this library is out of date by one version. They don't necessarily need to worry about it at that level, but they need to know that of their suite of applications, 20% of them don't even meet the baseline, right? That's how you get resources allocated to fix those problems. And a quote from my one of my favorite movies, Brazil. Um, listen, kid, we're all in this together, right? If you can have that attitude with the teams in which you interact with, you will find that you will get a ton more security work done than being the no people. Um, and with automation and, and writing that automation, not only to make your life better, to, but to make the results easier to uh, consume for the constituency, whether that's your red green on the baseline for executives or here's something dropped automatically into your backlog in JIRA, Right? That's how you win friends and influences and have people believe that you're really all in that together. Um, and that's it. Uh, happiness. <laughs> We're all in it together. Another great uh, uh, poster that was in that movie, Brazil. Um, I will be jumping into the Slack channel to answer any questions people have. Um,